بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد to موقف or not to موقف that still is the question today إن شاء الله تعالى we shall explore this model a bit further so to repeat what we have said before our sources of knowledge are the Quran and the Sunnah our types of knowledge are fiqh, aqidah, hadith, tafsir, and some others. And in between this knowledge, which is the final product from working with the Quran and the Sunnah, we'll have rulings in fiqh, we have matters of belief, we'll have a hadith that come down to us that are interpreted, taking rulings from, we have the tafsir of the Quran. In between this level and the source, we have matters like قواعد الفقه, أصول الفقه, مصطلح الحديث, شرح التعديل, أصول التفسير, etc. Which we consider our manhaj. This is how we work with this. This is why manhaj has often been translated as methodology. How do we work with the Quran and the Sunnah in order to reach a correct final product? Whether it be a ruling in fiqh, a matter of belief, an explanation of an ayah, an explanation of a hadith, etc. And we have said that one of the core matters at this level here is تحكيم المحكم and رد المتشابه إلى المحكم is basing our rulings on the ayat and the ahadith that are clear in meaning and clear in their indication and whatever is ambiguous matters that can mean one thing but can also mean another thing we choose the meaning that is in accordance with the muhkam, the clear ayat, the clear ahadith. So, then we moved on to disagreeing. And we have said that the idea that there is no disagreeing in aqidah, disagreeing in aqidah necessarily involves a bid'ah, whereas disagreeing in fiqh is okay. We said that this is a wrong understanding that is far too simplified and in reality is somewhat more complex than that so we said that disagreeing is of three types we have khilafu tanawwa where we have different ways that are all authentically legislated in our sharia like the three ways of doing hajj the different qiraat of the quran the different ways of doing salatul witr etc we have khilaf afham in this category here we don't say that two matters are right one of them is right or that the the, the contradicting i mean the the two different ways that are coming come out of here we don't say that both are right only one is right however the other one is within a range of acceptable interpretation from our sources based on what is here Whereas this particular, uh, lev this particular category here, Khilafu Tadad, which we can, I, I put it in the previous, uh, the, the way I wrote it previously, is contradicting. We could also call it clashing. Here we have a fatwa or a qawl, whatever, that is clearly contradicting, is clashing with the muhkam of the Quran and the Sunnah. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we shall explore something core to understanding why we have this type of disagreeing. When we are looking at the texts from the Sharia or even the Fatawa of the ulama, we see that we could, uh, that we can split them into three categories. This one here is what we call in Arabic, Qat'i. Ilmun Qat'i. Qat'i, from the word Qat'a, it means to cut. I think the best translation of it in English would be clear cut. For example, the fact that Allah is high. Allah is alive. It's in the Quran, Al Hayyul Qayyum, 
in many ayat, there is no room for there is no room for disagreeing here. You, you cannot make you cannot have a different understanding than that. The fact that salah is obligatory. Aqim is salah to lead the shams. Al Islam will be built on five shahadat and La ilaha illallah and salawat al khams. There is absolutely no room for saying no. I think that salah will only be obligatory for a certain category of people and other. No, that is qat'i. The fact that zakah is obligatory, that is qat'i, clear cut. Then we have another level, and this is ijtihadi. Now we have certain matters that. Going back to zakah, for example, we agree that zakah is obligatory. Zakah is qat'i. We agree upon the conditions of zakah. We agree upon the miqdar of zakah, like how much zakah is to pay on the different types of wealth. However, we are going to have a disagreement upon uh, zakah from the, the the jewelry that women are wearing jewelry that women have purchased or has been given to them and that they are wearing for you know beautifying themselves jewelry that has not been uh, that, that's not considered part of saving right some, some scholars have made this distinction it's like you, you buy jewelry for the sake of having gold and silver and possibly diamonds or other precious uh, metals or stones in order to have them as a security as we call it nowadays in, in, in legal terms or the things that are worn for you know beauty etc so some scholars say that the there is no zakah on the gold or the jewelry that a woman is wearing the zakah is only on the jewelry that is kept as a security so we see that from a qat'i, a core matter, which is zakah, which is absolutely agreed upon, as we are branching off into masail, we see that we start having some diversion, some, some, some disagreement based upon different understandings. Then the next, the next level, that's here. That is uh, where we have a clear clash with the Quran and the Sunnah so this here are the matters that we have to agree upon these here are the matters that we cannot agree upon because due to the complexity of the topic human beings are going to diverge about this because these human beings do not get wahi they do not get revelation and then we have the matters that we cannot accept because there is a clear clash with the Quran and the Sunnah. So, now going back to what we have announced or that what we have mentioned previously, the matter of believing that there is no khilaf in aqidah, but it's okay to have khilaf in fiqh. We cannot say that this is entirely wrong there is a basis to looking at matters this way but as I said this is a simplification what is the basis for this uh, for this approach well if we say that we have a number of matters that are qat'i and some matters that are ijtihadi well when we're talking about worldly matters these matters they're going to be extraordinarily broad they're going to change from one city to the next from one era to the next era from one person to the next person so it's going to be upon the skill and the deep knowledge of the scholar to make an ijtihad in order to see how good he can get it to how close he can get it to the truth however matters of belief are, are extremely limited Right? We do not have to rediscover who Allah is every generation or in every country or in every situation. Allah is Allah. 
that does this not change his angels are his angels whatever has been revealed to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam back in the days applies today from the umur al ghaib so we see that first of all the the scope of aqidah is far smaller than the scope of fiqh the scope of fiqh goes into countless volumes of matters that the scholars have analyzed in order to see how are we going to bring this new matter this new situation of the world this situation of this particular individual how we are going to bring it as close as we can to what has been revealed in the quran and the sunnah whereas matters of aqidah they will remain the same however we see that certain matters of aqidah which are as i said previously we agree upon the core however we see that at certain levels of of depth we have some unclarity an example is what some ulama have called akbar uh, hadith ishkalan fil aqidah the hadith that is the greatest mushkil in aqidah the greatest problematic situation in aqidah which is the hadith la adwa no contagion or no infection you will find an unbelievable amount of aqwal upon this sentence which is made up of two words la adwa so we clearly see that here we have a problem of ambiguity this is a matter of aqidah but it is an ambiguous hadith and it is surrounding by other ambiguous ahadith like for example fir fir min al majzum min al majzum firarak min al min al asad and at the same time we have the story of the man who came to see the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying yeah i had a camel that has you know made adwa contained that has infected uh all my other camels so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and this camel there where did he get it from so we see that this is a very mushkil matter in aqidah however we see that this is not core to matters of aqidah where we differ with the uh, tawaif the sects that have gone astray in aqidah so again to recapitulate aqidah the scope is far more limited first thing second thing we cannot that is from the manhaj now we cannot discover aqidah by other than the quran and the sunnah however some matters from the revelation are to some extent ambiguous and there is a scope for diverging on the interpretation of those particular matters but as i said again these are extremely limited right. whereas when we go to uh, to fiqh we see that the duration of revelation has been of 23 years it's, it was 23 years since the prophet first received revelation until he died sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam the matters of the end of all mankind throughout the ages from that time until the end of times could not have been clarified in detail in this short period of time so we actually see that and this is this is part of the the, the, the miracles of the sharia we see that certain events have happened in those days that laid a foundation for ulama to be able to make qiyas and ijtihad in order to bring those matters that are completely disconnected from what happened in those days and bring them or make a ruling upon them based on the Quran and the Sunnah. So, we're going to enter now into this book here which I have announced in uh, the first part of this series which is رفع المعلم عن الأئمة الأعلام Removing the blame 
from our great scholars by Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. So, Ibn Taymiyyah Taala starts saying, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi ala alaihi wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. <coughs> لا شريك له في أرضه ولا في سمائه وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وخاتم أنبيائه صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم صلاة دائما إلى يوم القيامة وسلم تسليما وبعد he says فيجب على المسلمين بعد موالاة الله تعالى ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم موالاة المؤمنين كما نطق به القرآن as for what follows, it is obligatory for the Muslims to first of all have muwala for Allah, allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa rasulihi and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and after that have muwala for the believers as the Quran has clearly mentioned. So I would like to let this sink in for a minute now. This is a book about disagreeing. And the first thing Shaykh Islam Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentions is the obligatory for Muslims to have muala for each other. Think about that for a minute. Let's move on. Khususan al ulama al hum warathatul anbiya and especially the scholars, the ones that are the inheritors of the prophets. الذين جعلهم الله بمنزلة النجوم يهتدى بهم في ظلمات البر والبحر The ones that Allah has Allah gave them the status of the stars in the sky because we navigate in the darkness of the land and the sea uh, by these stars Allah has given the scholars that same status Then he went on to say, "If kullu ummatin qabla ma ba'athi nabiyina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa'ulama'uha If kullu ummatin qabla ma ba'athi nabiyina sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa'ulama'uha shiraruha illa al-muslimina fa'inna ulama'uhum khiyaruhum Okay, so he said, every ummah before the uh, before this ummah, before the sending of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the worst of their people were their scholars, because their scholars have led them astray. Except for the ummah of Islam, this is what we say in غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين, right? المغضوب عليهم are the ulama of the Yahud who have um, who had the knowledge but have decided to act differently. And the Nasara who have left out their knowledge and have started acting without knowledge and led them to where they came from. Whereas the ulama of the Muslims, this ummah right here, the best people of this ummah, فَإِنَّ عُلَمَاءَهُمْ خِيَارُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ خُلَفَاءُ رَسُولِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ فِي أُمَّتِهِ وَالْمُحْيُونَ لِمَا مَاتَ مِنْ سُنَّتِهِ they are the ones that are taking over the Ummah after the Prophet Sallallahu and they are the ones to revive the Sunan, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu which has died across the years or along the years. Bihim qam al-kitab wa bihi qamu wa bihim nataq al-kitab wa bihi nataqu They, the, the book, the Quran has been preserved through them and they have uh, acted or they have been preserved also by the Quran. Then he said, وَلْيُعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَيْسَ لِأَحَدٍ مِنَ الْأَئِمَّةِ الْمَقْبُولِينَ عِنْدَ الْأُمَّةِ قَبُولًا عَامًا Then it should be known that none of the A'imma that are considered to be, that are generally amongst the Ummah be considered to be widely accepted, to be great scholars, people that we take knowledge from, that we take uh, that their opinion is taken into consideration. يعتمد في مخالفة رسول الله رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في شيء من سنة من سنته دقيق ولا جليل. That none of these widely accepted scholars 
we can accept from any of them anything that goes against the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he goes on to say فَإِنَّهُمْ مُتَّفِقُونَ اتِّفَاقًا يَقِينِينَ عَلَى وُجُوبِ اتِّبَاعِ الرَّسُولِ صلى الله عليه وسلم For verily, they are uh, in total agreement in, in they, they are in 100% agreement and upon 100% certainty upon the uh, obligation of following the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم وأن وعلى أن كل وعلى كل أحد من الناس يؤخذ من, من قوله ويترك and that anybody other than the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم from the people will take some of what he says and will have to leave out some other things now dear viewers I know that I haven't taught you anything new here but I would like you to think for a minute about how Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah opens up a book about Khilaf you see when we talk about Manhaj now we are really at the core of this level right here of knowledge we're saying that first of all these matters here those are the matters that the scholars are specialized in these are the matters by which the Quran is preserved among us and accessed this is what enables us to access the Quran and this is the playground of the scholars if you will then he said despite all of this despite the virtue of the scholars we will not accept anything from a scholar that goes against this so he is alluding to the fact that in the ummah there's going to be diverging and there's going to be diverging of this type here even amongst ahlus sunnah as we shall see and this is where he brings this core point which is you know the call of Imam Malik uh, rephrase we take from everybody and we also leave from everybody except for the person in this grave which is the Prophet ﷺ. we take everything from him anybody other than that we shall take what is correct and we are obliged to leave what is incorrect so these are principles basic fundamentals and then Shaykh al-Islam goes in to explain why why do we have this khilaf in the ummah so the first one asabab al-awwal alla yakun al-hadithu qad balagahu I will just read the, this in bullet points because it's quite long and a bit complicated he says the first reason why people disagree is that a certain scholar might not have gotten knowledge of a certain hadith. So as he does not have this hadith, his opinion upon this particular mas'ala might be different. He might base himself upon another hadith and make a qiyas in order to find a ruling, in order to bring it closer to the sunnah. And he does not know that as a matter of fact, we already have a hukam from the sunnah upon this particular topic but this is probably one of the simplest and rarest matter to deal with and it was probably more widespread in the uh, in the early generations asabab al-thani ayakun al-hadithu qad balagahu lakinnahu lam yathbut indahu the second case is that the hadith has reached him however this particular scholar the, the chain of hadith which has reached him is unauthentic ha hadith are transmitted through different chains so in the early days before the compilation of the sunan you would have certain scholars that made a fatwa that would go against an authentic hadith which has been authentically reported by another muhaddith however the reason why this scholar here has not taken this hadith into consideration is because the isnad the, the chain of narration which reached him he knows that this chain was unauthentic so he has rejected this authentic hadith because it has not reached him in an authentic way the third way or the third reason is that the hadith has reached him 
And another scholar would consider this chain of narration being authentic, but this scholar here considers this chain of narration being inauthentic. So that brings us to this level right here. Now we are talking about sciences of hadith, and we see that scholars, which is a matter of manhaj, selecting information, that is a core matter of manhaj, but we see that scholars disagree, there is a scope for disagreeing, a reasonable scope for disagreeing, whether this particular chain of narration is correct or not. Now that's, you see here, I, I insist on this matter of scope. We have the a'imma of the sunnah that will disagree upon a chain of narration. This is not like some of the a'imma of dalal who want to reject a hadith and in order to reject this hadith will claim that this chain is unauthentic. And maybe one of the, the, the most blatant example of this is um, Amr ibn Ubaid who was one of the heads of the Mu'tazila who rejected the hadith um, about Qadr where the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, while the baby is in the womb uh, the angel will be ordered to write whether this baby is from the people of Hellfire or the people of Paradise Shaqiyun am Sa'id So Abr ibn Ubaid he said had I heard this hadith from this narrator who is the last part of the chain that reached him or that, that reached the muhaddith from this era he was said I wouldn't have accepted if I had heard it from the next one I would have rejected it if I heard it from the next one I would have denied it if I had heard it from the prophet I wouldn't have I don't remember how he phrased it exactly but he would not have accepted hadith. and he said if I had heard it from Allah I would have said Ya Rabb that's not what you have uh, that, that's not what we have agreed upon with you obviously this man has been you know considered uh, an apostate and a complete heretic by our scholars but this is an example of that shows you the difference between afham and tabad in this first case we spoke about there is scope for disagreeing what uh, Amr ibn Ubaid has done, there is absolutely nothing that can justify such an attitude. Moving forward. السبب الرابع اشتراطه في خبر الواحد العدد الحافظ شروطا يخارف فيها غيره. Once again, that goes uh, that goes back to the previous point. That's just a more precise uh, matter in the sciences of hadith. When you have al khabar al wahid al adal al hafiz you have a hadith that has been translated that, that has been narrated by a single individual who is Adal so in Jarh wa Ta'adil he is uh, he's somebody who is considered uh, to be righteous and virtuous and he's also Hafid means that uh, he has a certain level he has a certain level in reliability right he uh, al Hafid is not the full uh, level of liability and there is khilaf amongst the scholars on on these grades shurutan yukharif fiha ghayruhu different a'imma will have different conditions from accepting a hadith that has been transmitted by a single individual like this so once again we are disagreeing upon matters of manhaj but it is disagreement within a scope that is acceptable السبب الخامس أن يكون الحديث قد بلغه وثبت عنده لكن نسيه وهذا يرد في الكتاب والسنة the fact that the hadith has reached this particular scholar but he forgotten it that also happens and he makes a fatwa you will see that we, we have cases where a alim from a certain level within the chains of narration have made a fatwa that contradicts a hadith that they have narrated further down the line. So we see that 
within the, the chain of narration of this hadith we see oh but there is fulan but he said this he gave this fatwa that contradicts this and this fatwa was given in this particular country that means that he must have gotten this hadith before this fatwa and it's very simply because he has forgotten this hadith this happens human beings moving forward al sabab al sadis adam ma'rifatihi bi dilalati al hadith and now we are coming to matters that are closer to what we are upon today the fact that a scholar knows a hadith he learned it by heart he knows its authenticity but he does not understand the indication of this hadith there is something called dalil that's the indicator and then you have dilalatun that's the indication and then you have the madlul which is what it indicates and then you have the istidlal that's the way you use this hadith to indicate something so here Shaykh al-Islam he's talking about the Dilala. This scholar has not understood or has misunderstood what this hadith implies. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has announced that this would happen. Some people will transmit a hadith to somebody who will understand it better than themselves. So from the meanings of this hadith is that some people do have the hadith but the, the, the depth of the understanding from this hadith will be different and this is why when we talk about madahib of fiqh madahib of fiqh al-ijtihad al-mutlaq this is something extraordinarily rare we do not only have our four imams uh, Abu Hanifa, uh, Malik Shafi and Ahmad but those are the only four that were preserved. We also have Al-Awza'i, uh, Layth ibn Sa'ad and others from the Salaf. However, their madhab, their, their deep understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, their deep understanding of the Dilala, which they used in order to extract these usul, it has only been preserved from these four. Next one. We have <coughs> the seventh reason So now it's not that he doesn't understand the hadith totally But he believes that this particular hadith doesn't indicate this particular mas'ala He believes that the hadith doesn't apply to this matter right here As thamin اعتقادها أن تلك الدلالة قد عارضها ما دل على أنها ليست مرادة. Now here it becomes very important. We see that we could have a hadith that, in some ways or within a certain scope, clash. Like for example, like the example that I've given you, لا عدوى. No infection. But at the same time, we have fir min al majdum, firaraka min al asad. Run from the uh, leprous person as, like you would run from a, from a lion. So, how do, we, how do we combine these two hadith which are conflicting? So, if we have somebody who only hears one hadith, he will base his ruling on the apparent meaning of this hadith whereas somebody who knows both a hadith knows that what this scholar has understood from this one hadith alone cannot be the full picture of what is meant because we have another a hadith which opposes some of the meanings that this scholar has understood from this hadith and here we are here now we are fully in this circles right here now we are in matters of ijtihad and now we are in the scope of afham different scholars will understand different things as-sababu at-tasa anna al-hadith mu'aradun bima yadullu ala ba'fihi mu'aradun bima dalla ala ba'fihi aw naskhihi aw ta'wilihi in kana qailan bit ta'wil all right so here he said that the scholar will reject a hadith based upon the fact that he believes that this hadith is either abrogated or uh, weak 
or interpreted. We'll not go into this. We'll move forward. Al-Sabu al-Ashir, mu'aradatuhu bima yadallu ala da'fihi wa nashihi. All right, this is similar to the previous one, and these are matters that are more complicated, but where, all right. What I want you to remember from all of this is that we have matters that are qat'i, clear cut. And as we shall see, we still have some disagreement here, right? But it is very low and not a big problem. Then we have matters that are much wider, where we have a scope for misunderstandings. And then we have matters which are unacceptable. So, Shaykh al-Islam rahmahullah ta'ala says further on in the book, ولكن الذي قد يخاف على بعض العلماء أن يكون الرجل قاصرا في درك حكم تلك المسألة فيقول ما عدم أسباب القول وإن كان له فيها نظر واجتهاد أو يقصر في الاستدلال فيقول قبل أن يبلغ النظر نهايته مع كونه متمسكا بحجة أو يغلب عليه عادة أو غرض يمنعه يمنعه من استفاء النظر لينظر فيما يعارض ما عنده وإن كان وإن كان لم يقول إلا بالاجتهاد والاستدلال فإن الحد الذي يجب أن ينتهي إليه الاجتهاد قد لا ينضبط للمجتهد. Alright. شيخ الإسلام is saying that one of the core or one of the reasons why we have issues at this level and possibly even in this level is the fact that a scholar might speak, give his fatwa, give his opinion before having gone into sufficient depth in that particular matter. And there's a reason why I've chosen this matter here particularly and this is the what I call the drive through fatwa you know the McDonald's drive through uh, you come with your car you know you order something and then a few meters down the line you get your order and you move on when we have complicated matters especially from the West which is an extraordinarily complicated context which has elements to it that differ very widely from the elements of this part of the world right here, the Middle East and Saudi Arabia in particular. When you call up a scholar and you ask him a question that does by no means explain the depth of the complexity of the situation that people face in the West. And you catch a scholar off guard. A scholar is a human being you catch him off guard and you ask him this question out of the blue, what is the first thing that will come to mind, uh, will come to the mind of the scholar is the context that he is dealing with on a daily basis. Scholars are dealing with questions coming in one after another. Some scholars, the sheikh is sitting in his office and he is receiving question after question after question after question the overwhelming majority of these questions will be within a context that he knows very well and that is fresh in his mind. You coming from out of the blue, catching him off guard, you're not giving him time to switch, you're not giving him time to ponder and consider the matters properly. And then you're running with this fatwa and causing havoc in the West. That is an example of what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah is talking about. What I'm getting at is as us Westerners, we need to deeply review our, our process of getting uh, guidance from our scholars throughout the world. First of all, 
we have to understand that within a, a very large scope we have people in the West that are because one their level of knowledge like for example Sheikh Tahir White because of his level of knowledge and second because of his deep understanding of the dynamics and the reality of the situation of the West is in a better position to guide people upon certain matters like these so there is a wide scope for referring to people like Sheikh Tahir White Hafidahullah Ta'ala rather than a quick fatwa from a short phone conversation that lasts less than a minute that comes from a scholar that might be far more knowledgeable than Tahir White but that does not understand that not as he doesn't understand he does not know and he does not understand either the intricacies of the context where this question is coming from nor does he fully understand the consequences of his fatwa this is of course not going to be in matters of aqidah no doubt about that it's going to be in matters of fiqh and it's going to be about matters of fiqh that are the complexities from the context where we come from where you need to have ijtihad to bring people as close as it gets to the Quran and the Sunnah in the particular situation but also in the long term moving forward he says that's why scholars were scared that الاجتهاد المعتبر the ijtihad that is acceptable has not been fulfilled in a particular fatwa and this is people this is very real in what I have explained to you the complexity from our matters of the West I'm going to give you a simple example voting now I am not pro or against voting I am I am quiet about voting because I don't know however what I can tell you what I can tell you is that most of the fatawi that I've heard about voting those are fatawi that have been made without sufficient study of the context and the consequences of voting or not voting for those that I've heard maybe there are fatawi out there because I have not really followed up on that topic but by the time this question was being brought to me to be put forward to people of knowledge um, I was being given Fatawi that usually from our ulama of Ahl Sunnah would be going uh, in the direction of not voting but looking at these Fatawi I could see that they were not uh, you could see that the way they were formulated they were not taking into consideration the context that the people were in and people were adding elements of context now in many cases I have not managed to put these fatawi forward because it's always you know a matter of getting the attention of the scholar having enough time to explain a fatwa in this those are the, the problematics that we're dealing with however once I have managed to put a question through to Sheikh Ubaid about voting in Belgium and Sheikh Ubaid, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he said that people should vote. Right? This was recorded. I don't know where this recording is. I don't have it anymore. It's out there. So this was a fatwa based on context. And we need far more of this. And when we have people like Tahir White and others, but I'm mentioning Tahir White in particular and I'll talk more about that in coming episodes inshallah ta'ala these people 
are more in right to answer such questions and I trust I trust people like Tahir White that when they feel uncomfortable with their own ruling, with their own ijtihad, they will make phone calls and they will discuss matters and they will get guidance in a proper way. Not somebody from the lay people who knows two, three words of Arabic, calls a scholar, throws a question out, they get to and goes on internet, YouTube, hashtags, etc. And, and we are creating more of this and more of this. Moving forward. فَهَذِهِ ذُنُوبٌ لَكِنْ لُحُوكُ عُقُوبَةَ الذَّنْبِ بِصَاحِبِهِ إِنَّمَا يَنَالُ إِنَّمَا يَنَالُ مَنْ لَمْ يَتُبْ وَقَدْ يَمْحُوهَا الْإِسْتِغْفَارُ وَالْإِحْسَانُ وَالْبَلَى وَالشَّفَاعُ وَالْرَحْمَةُ Okay, moving forward. وَلَمْ يَدْخُلْ فِي هَذَا مَنْ يَغْلِبُهُ الْهَوَى وَيَسْرَعُهُ Shaykh al-Islam is saying that here we are talking about ijtihad of people who are correct in this matter. It's within the, the scope. We are not talking about the people who are following their ahwa. They want something. They want this particular ruling. They want an end product here. So now they're going to be, they start to mess with all this here in order to justify the end ruling here. That's hawa. That's what hawa is. Hawa is like your inclinations, what you want, what you desire. You want this to happen, but all of this here has become a barrier to this. So now you start messing, trying to fiddle with this, trying to re rewire all of this in order to get this to be in accordance with your final product. And what's the way to do this? al mutashabih That's one of the greatest ways to do this, as we have mentioned before. Moving forward. Then, very important, so we said that the people who will be in this situation, the people of Hawa, they will fall into this. But then Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi, rahmahullah he goes on saying, فَلَوْ فَرَضَ وَقُوعُ بَعْضِ هَذَا مِنْ بَعْضِ الْأَعْيَانِ مِنَ الْعُلِمَاءِ الْمَحْمُودِينَ عِنْدَ الْأُمَّةِ مَعَ أَنَّ هَذَا بَعِيدٌ وَغَيْرُ وَاقِعُ لَمْ يُعْدَمْ أَحَدُهُمْ لَمْ يُعْدَمْ أَحَدُهُمْ أَحَدَ هَذِي الْأَسْبَاب uh, so, Sheikh Islam says that if this was to happen from any of our aimma, our well-known, well-respected scholars from our ummah, although this is very unlikely, and he even says غير واقع, it's you know it is not happening. He says, but at the same time, he says you know that was this to happen and to some extent it does happen we have what we call قول شاد an, an abnormal fatwa an abnormal opinion of certain of our great a'imma this does not diminish from his virtue or his level فَإِنَّنَا لَا نَعْتَقِدُ فِي الْقَوْمِ الْعِسْمَ we do not believe that these human beings are exempt from mistake they are not <coughs> they are not ma'asum, they are not protected from Allah from mistakes. No, human beings make mistakes. <laughs> we say that sins can come from them. <laughs> we say that they can fall into sin, they can fall into mistakes, they can even fall to some extent into hawa. That's why Shaykh Islam says it's a sin not just a mistake it's a sin however with all of that we we hope and we believe that Allah is going to forgive them because of all the good that they have brought to the ummah furthermore now very important then he says thumma this I'm going a bit further ثم هذه الأحاديث منقسمة إلى اتفاق العلماء على العلم والعمل بالحديث بالأحاديث القطعية بأن يكون قطعية السند والمتن. Now we're talking about this. Now Sheikh Al Islam is proving the point that I made earlier on. So we said that أحاديث are 
split in two categories. From this category is the ahadith that are qat'iyu sanad wal matan that are clear cut about the authenticity of the narration and the matan, the content of the hadith. وَهُوَ مَا تَيَقَّنَّا أَنَّ الرَّسُولَ صلى الله عليه وسلم قاله It's what we are absolutely certain that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said this وَتَيَقَّنَّا أَنَّهُ أَرَادَ بِهِ تِلْكَ السُّورَةِ And we are also certain that this is what the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم meant by this. So here we are, three mat- we have three matters. Absolutely sure about the authenticity of the hadith, the chain. Absolutely sure about the authenticity of the matan. It's a bit of a complicated topic. We'll not go into this. But we're also sure about the meaning, the indication, the implication of this hadith. This is what we say here. Those are clear-cut matters from the deen. And most of the aqidah will be in this field here. وَإِلَى مَا دِلَالَتُهُ ظَاهِرَةٌ غَيْرَ قَطْعِيَّةٌ And then we have another قط- category that it does have a clear meaning but it's not 100%. It's not an ambiguous متشابه However, with this hadith there is room for ijtihad. There is room for different understandings. فَأَمَّا الْأَوَّلُ فَيَجِبُ اِعْتِقَادُهُ عِلْمًا وَعَمَلًا Sorry. فَيَجِبُ اِعْتِقَادُ مُوْجِبِهِ عِلْمًا وَعَمَلًا وَهَذَا مَا لَا خِلَافَ فِيهِ بَيْنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ فِي الْجُمْلَةِ So the first category that is clear cut upon isnad, matan and meaning, we have to stick to it belief-wise and action-wise. And he says... There is no disagreement on the whole on this particular matter. وَإِنَّمَا قَدْ يَخْتَلِفُونَ فِي بَعْضِ الْأَخْبَارِ هَلْ هُوَ قَطْعِيُ السَّنَدِ أَمْ لَيْسَ بِقَطْعِي So, we're gonna have disagreeing upon some narrations. Is it, is the chain 100% correct or is it not 100% correct? هَلْ هُوَ قَطْعِيُ الدِّلَالَ Is it clear cut? Is the dilala, the indication of this hadith, clear cut or is it not clear cut? مثل اختلافهم في في خبر الواحد الذي تلقته الأمة بالقبول والتصديق أو الذي اتفقت أو الذي اتفقت على العمل به. Okay, moving forward. Alright, this video has already been quite long. Before going into more details about these matters, we shall stop here. What I want you to take away from this is understanding that khilaf is acceptable and non-acceptable. So when we are blaming people for disagreeing upon something, We got to make sure that those are matters that are clearly clashing with the Quran and the Sunnah, that are matters at this level. That have a muhkam text that is qat'iyu al-dilala, qat'iyu al-sanad, qat'iyu al-matan, and qat'iyu al-dilala. That it's a matter which does not leave any room for disagreeing. The indication is clear cut. And we shall see that a lot of what people have been blamed for, in, I said before in the West, but it's not only in the West, it is worldwide. A lot of du'at have worldwide being blamed and thrown under the bus, eliminated from the da'wah scene having had massive smear campaigns 
erected against them based on matters that are not qat'i uddilala that are matters of ijtihad because it was said that these are matters from manhaj and that there is no room for disagreeing upon this because it's manhaj and so these people have to be excommunicated and made run away from we shall see examples of this in further episodes subhanakallahumma bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik